Welcome back, guys. Thank you uh, for listening in to another episode of the ADH Dads. Uh, we got a very special recording for you today. I'm very excited to have Sir Jason Palmer with us. He is the host of a podcast called Foster Care Nation. Him and his wife run that, and I'm very excited to kind of dive in with him and get his story and see what foster uh, dadding looks like, because I am always interested to talk to other men who are not bio dads like myself. I, I know I've mentioned this a couple times, but I'm a stepdad to three kiddos. So Jason has, you know, 1,300 kids. So I'm really excited to hear about what life looks like for him, man. So welcome, Jason. How are you doing today? It's 1,301 today. Oh, all right. <laughs> you know, I just had a similar conversation with a guy at church this morning about that, that something you just mentioned right there that I'm pretty passionate about. Way back in the day when my wife and I first got together, um, she already had a little boy when I met her. He was two, and his dad had bounced and just decided not to be a dad anymore. And um, and I had showed up, and he knew me. He just called me dad. The guy I worked for, John Reeser, was a real good guy. And John asked him one day, he said, well, what, what, is, what do you call him? Do you call him your stepson or just your son? I'm like, he's, look, this kid has made it into the, the group of people that I will kill to protect. He's just my kid. He's my son. And we just, it's son. It's, it's too simple. And, and he, he goes, that's, that's the way it should be. That, and that's kind of the first time I ever even thought about the question. And today with all the different kids we have in our house. Okay. So my oldest daughter was legally speaking, biologically speaking, she was my wife's half sister. Okay. She was a year and a half older than our oldest son. They shared a mom and she dealt with, so she, still, this has been 20 something years later, still dealing with addiction. And this little girl grew up in my house. She went to school from my address. She ate my food. We put clothes on her back. When she cried because she was hurt or sad, it was on my knee. That was my little girl, right? So that, that, was, my, that was my oldest of kids. And then my wife had the, the, a son of hers that, that was, I was a stepdad. And then my wife and I had a bio son together and so there was a bio kid. And since then, we've adopted several kids. We've adopted four kids through the foster system. We have two more that look like they're inbound here pretty soon. Um, we're getting to the place where they'll probably be adopted kids soon. And we've had close to 30 kids come through our house through the foster system. And I'm going to tell you, the truth is, is this is my kid. I don't care about all the other labels. Bio step half. I have a... My dad and my stepmom raised her grandson because her daughter was really sick and they raised that made Timmy like I, he was like my double half step nephew in law. I don't know. It was just Timmy, right? Like I, I can't see putting that much work in and identifying what sort of weird biological relational relationship you have with somebody. Yeah. This, these are just my kids. Yeah. You know, that's interesting because I, um, you know, I, I faced a lot of uh, boundaries in my stepdadding journey of what is the proper term that I can use, you know, as a, as a bonus dad, uh, you know, when I talk about the kids, you know, our, the bio dad is still in the picture for our, our kids here, you know, he's, he's active and, and, and takes them for every other weekend. And, you know, so there was a lot of boundaries that I had to navigate of not wanting to step on his toes and using the word dad and, you know, in certain scenarios, but I feel the same way, you know, I had to kind of go into this relationship and the mindset of, I have to love these kids like I would love my own, you know, and uh, again, going back to what I was saying and talking to you and why I'm interested in talking to you and how you share your love with all these kids that that aren't yours is just a, a fascinating story and perspective to me, because again, you know, going into this relationship with three kids, I, I definitely had a lot of pushback from a lot of uh, family and friends as far as, you know, there's plenty of women out there without kids. And, you know, that's a big responsibility. Why would you want to do that? You know, what's wrong with you to want to step in and, and take on that responsibility, you know, and, you know, um, you know, what was the, the, the other one that I heard of, you know, she's not looking to, to have you raise her kids, is she, you know, when I, when we first started dating and that was, to be honest, I've, I've thought about that. And, I don't know how you could date someone that has kids without a little bit of like, this is a huge responsibility. And I really have to think of the weight of that. <laughs> right. You know, because I think that again, if you're going to, if you're going to date someone with kids, you kind of have to have a mindset of I'm putting everything I have into this. I can't half ass this, you know, I'm going to definitely have to have 
some participation in the growth of these kids, right? Oh yeah, you know if you, and, and if I, if anybody's looking at the video, you can you can see a little bit here. Like there's Frankie tattooed on my arm. There's yeah. Jason Junior tattooed. I've got kids <laughs> tattooed all the way up and around. Um, I have seven that. different kids tattooed on me. They're the kids that I that I own that are mine. I have two more that I'm gonna have to, I'm running out of real estate. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how to take, how to manage that? But but that at the end of the day, like. They're just my kids. And if I'm telling a story and somebody has some sort of, if, okay, so if I'm talking about our oldest daughter, her bio mom and bio dad are still alive in this world. I don't know why, because they are horrible human beings. I mean, they've done some horrible things. I've got stories about just what drug addiction does to people, right? And we, we've all seen how that can really just change a person. And, and the truth is, is if I'm telling a story about her and one of them was around, I just call her my girl, you know? Yeah. This is my girl. Um, I, I don't have to use my daughter to make somebody else necessarily, you know, understand the whole. It, it's not important. You don't need to know the exact definition of who this girl is. At the end of the day, when she was sick and in the hospital, and my wife was there and she said, Mom, when can daddy come spend the night? She did not mean her bio dad. Yeah. She she really didn't want the guy who was deep in his meth addiction to come spend the night in the children's hospital with her. You know, I know who I was to her. I know who she was to me. And that's that's all that matters. The rest of the world can have all their opinions. And I really don't give a damn about their opinions as to whether or not it's a real dad or a real... like. Y'all can just go put your head in, in something and, and just stay there for a while because I'm not interested in your opinions. If you want to judge what I call my family, my family is unconventional. I have mixed races. I have, I mean, our family looks like a little mini UN over here and I live in <laughs> rural Missouri. Let me tell you, we get some looks sometimes <laughs> Yeah, and, and I don't care. Like we're, we're just us. And sometimes yeah. we're a loving, wonderful, happy, caring family. And sometimes these kids beat the other loving crap out of each other and treat each other like crap. And if you grew up in a family, you know that's that's just how siblings do. And that's who we are. And I don't need anybody else's approval to decide whether or not we're a real family. Did you grow up with a large family or did you grow up in the, the foster care system? What, what did childhood look like for you? And how did you kind of get motivated to go into that world of, of foster care? Okay, I come in kind of a strange way, right? I had, we had, I had four, four siblings growing up. It was what we had, two boys, two girls. And we were raised up in a, um, in a religious organization that I would maybe call a cult, and my mom would get mad because she's still in that group, and she doesn't like it when I use that word. So <laughs> we'll just say they were a very fundamentalist organization. And, and, and so when I, when I grew up, um, I had a lot of issues as I grew up about that stuff. And when I, when I finally got old enough and I left that group and I went out on my own and did my own thing and ended up, uh, you know, with my wife and we were married by then and, and had, we had three kids, you know, we had our oldest girl who we, we took care of, not biologically ours, but we took care of her. Um, we had her, my wife's son, and then uh, me and my wife's son. And ironically, if you want to know the truth of the matter, because she was still married when her husband bounced, they were still legally married. He just was disappeared. I, we had to get, we were poor. We were raising three kids on $20,000 a year. We had to finance the divorce. I had to come up with the money. So right. she was still legally married to him when, when, when um, Austin, our biological kid was born. And so I couldn't be listed on the birth certificate. So every one of my kids I have actually adopted every one of my kids to include wow. my own body. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that is interesting. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So so my wife grew up in, in a house that was um, way more difficult than mine was, although I had some difficult stuff. She grew up in a home. Her mom was, was an addict at the time. She It was a drug house. There was all kinds of craziness that happened around her as a child. And so, you know, she always grew up with the idea that, I want to be that person who's there for the kids, the kids like me who didn't have anybody. I mean, she should have been in foster care. She never was pulled into the system. And so when we met, she told me that she'd like, she wanted to have a dozen kids. And I laughed and she, I didn't notice she didn't laugh. <laughs> 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 laughing now. 
<laughs> because we're, we're so much higher in kids. But when, when Austin was born, she had a lot of complications and the doctor basically told her, look, we can try and try and fix this. Um, but there's a chance you could bleed out and die on the operating table before that happens. Um, so we're probably better off to go ahead and do a partial hysterectomy. And that's, that's what we did. And so we have three kids at this point. I, when I turn 41 years old, my youngest kid's going to graduate high school. We're going to go out and see the world. We're going to be able to buy nice furniture, which if you have kids, you know, you don't get to do that yet. Uh, <laughs> and we're got all these cool things, man. Like that's what's going to happen. And it turns out I was wrong. Every time you tell God what your plans are, he laughs. And he goes, oh, yeah, well, Jesus, hold my beer. <laughs> Yeah, I was just going to say the best laid plans go to waste, huh? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. And and so my wife and I, had, we had discussed adoption at one point. And we looked at it and we looked back during China's one child policy and the plight of the Chinese girls was something that was really kind of heavy on me a bit. And we looked into it and I said, I ain't got an extra 30 grand to adopt a kid. You know, I can't do that. And then one day as I'm riding down the road and I'm listening to a radio station, if you remember Dr. Dobson, um, he had a broadcast where he called focus on the family. And as he's talking, he's talking about kids in foster care. He's talking about kids who need adopting. And, and the whole time I'm listening to him talk and he, he has a religious bent to him. And I'm like, Oh yeah. See, and I'm, I'm in my own self-righteous moment here. All you self-righteous Christian church folks out there, you ain't even taking care of this. Yeah. You know, he says, if one family out of every third church in America would adopt a kid out of the foster system, it would be empty tomorrow. And I'm sitting over here on my high horse going, yeah, all you, you so-called religious folks, you, you, you could have taken care of this. So I could, what are you doing about it? And about that time, I'm not going to blame this on God, but I'm going to say the voice in my head said, what are you doing, asshole? And I was like, mm. <laughs> that was convicting. <laughs> and, um, I, I was at the time I was writing a, an editorial piece for the for the local newspaper and and I went down to the local children's division to ask them some questions around Christmas time how how people can give to kids in our area who need things and I left with a stack of stuff about foster care the you know, the gal apparently if you walk into those offices and you're not already somebody who has a kid in foster care uh, and you're a potential resource parent they're just going to load you up with resources to to take this home and and go think about it. And my wife saw it and like her eyes lit up and she's like, wow, this is what I've been looking for. And turns out like a week or two later, there was another class starting and we talked about it. We thought, you know, I think we could do this. You know, why not? And immediately we we're in a class. There was no wait really at all. We're in a class. Everything went boom, boom, boom. We went right through the process. The day that the worker came to our house to give us the license that's here's your official foster care license. She, she hands us that and she says, and by the way, I want to talk to you about these two kids, which if you ever look at foster care, trust me, they're going to do that kind of stuff to you. <laughs> and, and those two kids actually ended up becoming our very first placement of, of any kids who stayed with us. And they and stayed with us permanently as well. You know, so they're, they're kids, the first two kids that we adopted out of the foster system as well. So we had really kind of a roundabout, you know, way of stepping into this. And as I look back over time, I go, hmm. Yeah, I think God had a plan this whole time, and I thought I was making it up. But you know, we just ended up in the place where I feel like we were supposed to be because since then we have walked so many journeys. We've had somewhere, I think, just north of 30 kids come and, and stay with us for a while, some for just a night, some of them for more than you know a year and a half. But but that, that has led us to the place where we're at now with, uh, what, four kids adopted to the system and actually – um, this coming up week, the little one of the little girls we have with us, uh, we're going to court to, um, it looks like her, her case is about to be finalized and finished up, and then she'll be available for adoption. And instead of technically owning seven kids, we'll, we'll be staring down number eight. And, and I expect by this time next year, we'll be, we'll have number nine in the books as well, because she's already here and we're just walking through that, um, through that process there. So, you know, and both of these are our cases where, you know, the mom's, bio mom just is tied up in their own addiction stuff and has chosen not to work a case plan chosen to do nothing it's not like we're out here trying to steal babies it's just that these are babies who needed a place and and they're by yeah do you have any parents that are that you're working with or are working with the system to try to get their kids back or that you kind of maybe co-parent alongside with as they're staying with you Right now, we have in the past worked a little bit with some of the families. Um, 
that can be such a sticky wicket to get in the middle of, you know, because yeah, yeah they don't want to oftentimes nobody wants to hear advice from the person who's raising your kids. Yeah. It, yeah. it gets into this judgmental type of, of feeling for a lot of times I think, and I don't blame them. Hmm. Right. They, they're assuming that, Oh, well he must think I'm a horrible person because he's got to raise my kids. I get it. Yeah. And no matter how kind I try and be, I'm, we're going to have some of that in that relationship. Most of the time. I get a lot of that as, as a stepdad. So I can, I can only imagine as, as a foster dad and, and what that looks like when there's, you know, you said eight other co-parents in the, in that situation. Yeah. And just the two youngest girls we have in our house, they're not biologically related. So four different, four parents, you know, two on each of them. And there is, I think 20 half siblings between those two kids. Uh, it's it's spread out and it's difficult and it's confusing and there's a million parents and step parents and boyfriends and you know honestly we just tend to you know we we tend to just do what we can for the kids and if somebody is working a plan then we're more than willing to support them wherever we can yeah. unfortunately in our area and i think most areas right now the heroin epidemic is just running rampant and I've seen heroin just steal souls. Yeah. And when somebody gets into the, a deep addiction with that, I, I'm not even going to say that that I'm willing to, to just accuse them and say, you know, you just have to cl- you know, clean up your addiction and you got it. Man, I don't know that you always get that next chance to say no after the first time. Yeah. Just seeing what it does to humans. And it just turns them into a, into a life support machine for the drug. And it's it's challenging and it's sad. Because we deal with the aftermath of that with the kids. Yeah. I will eventually be asked by every kid, why didn't my mommy love me enough to get rid of the drugs? Yeah. That's, I've been that's asked. Tough. That's a hard question to ask. You know, for yeah. them, to, for especially when you have a five-year-old little girl ask you that. Yeah, you know, I would like to think that there are parents out there that, that do put forth that effort. I... You know, I have a um, close relationship with with foster families. Um, my, my wife grew up in a foster family. Her parents were foster parents to a lot of a lot of kids. You know, she's got uh, on top of her two bio siblings. She's got what three, four, ten, ten other siblings, adopted siblings. <laughs> I'm, I'm hearing three or four. She's got ten. <laughs> Also, my best friend, uh, you know, that I grew up with, um, you know, in Arizona, he grew up in the foster system. Um, His parents got their life back together and cleaned up and and got custody of him back. And uh, now he's a foster dad and uh, has adopted uh, four kids that I am a godfather to, you know, and still very active in in their kids' lives. And, uh, you know, I love to see that he's grown up in the foster care system and grown up a a very good man, uh, a God man, a godly man and religious man and a family man and and works hard to provide and and has good morals to him um, and and does good things like you're saying with the foster care system and really trying to to pay that forward. And it's admirable to watch him and in his life journey because, you know, he's been through some hard stuff, man. Uh, A lot of a lot of drug addiction and uh, exposure to prostitution and, and violence and and murder and abuse and uh he's grown up a good man you know so when i when i meet people like you jason uh I, you know and 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 i think about my 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 buddy there and and uh some of the experiences that i've seen it just gives me a lot of hope you know that um that that these kids that maybe come from um a hard background can still experience a lot of love you know as they walk through their trauma and and try to try to figure out their life journey so just really really uh glad to have you in this world jason doing what you do i appreciate that man the the truth is 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 i thought at first like we're, we're gonna bring these kids and we're gonna love them and that that's all they they really just need some love and and turns out they don't just need love right they're gonna need some therapy too most likely and i thought i was gonna help fix them i I found out I don't I don't have the the responsibility or the right to fix them most of the time. The only thing I can do as a grown ass man with these kids from horribly broken backgrounds, because some of these some of their kids' stories are well, I mean they're horrible. All I can do is create an environment 
where healing can occur when they're ready to begin the journey. But man, we deal with the side effects and the after effects. I think every one of our kids in the house at this point, have, you know, have exposed either early childhood, or early childhood, or in utero drug exposure. And we're seeing some of that the outworkings of that as these kids get a little bit older. I've got one daughter like this girl is she's bright. She scared me the other day. She said, Dad, I can't decide who has a better medical school, Harvard or Yale. And she's looking at colleges. And I'm like, um, I hear the the community college has a really good starter program, baby. <laughs> but I mean, this guy, but you know, even with she is a smart kid, she makes great decisions, you know, like things that I never would have thought of as a kid is at 15 years old, she has, she has a personal policy. When she dates somebody after they break up, she takes a three months hiatus before she will, she'll date anybody else. She wants a full three months in between. She doesn't want a rebound relationship. And I'm like at 15, like if a girl dumps you and five minutes later, want to ask you out, like you're, you're, you're all about that. She's, she's a smart kid and she deals with, some after effects of the psychological stuff of this. You know, I, I've got a little, my, one of my little guys, he's nine years old. This kid deals with, with anger, like big anger. And he deals with dissociation, like crazy dissociation stuff. And, and we have spent a lot of time with, with therapists and play therapists and I'm figuring out the best way to handle that in the moment. And it's taken me a while to, to get Zen with the fact that my kids are not neurotypical kids. And they're going to be the ones who in public are going to act out a bit sometimes. And other people are going to look and point a finger and say something. And quite frankly, I've spent 40 something years looking like this. I don't care what you think about me. <laughs> you know, I've just given up giving a crap what anybody thinks. So, so I'll just, and if somebody decides to say something ignorant in public, I'm just going to tell you the big brown, hairy, scary guy with a big black beard who was in the military long enough to learn how to speak loudly and clearly so those nearby can clearly hear and understand. Like, I'm not afraid to step in and correct somebody if I need to. But I usually don't have that problem because they tend to keep their distance. But that's that's what I have to do. As a matter of fact, tomorrow morning, uh, we're going over to the school. My uh, seven-year-old, who I, I jokingly say he is like, he has a premium version of ADHD. Um <laughs> Like his kids, his imagination is amazing. Like it is with ridiculously crazy, vivid imagination with stuff. And his just so, he's so happy some days. This kid wakes up some days giggling. And I'm like, what? Like I wake up cussing because it hurts so bad, you know? <laughs> I don't know what it's like to wake up laughing. Just the happiest kid. And, and then he also has the other side of it. You know, he also has some generalized anxiety disorder. And so we're going over to the school to talk about a 504 plan tomorrow. And I have a um, a school counselor over there who seems unwilling to um, to really be a, a partner in creating a healthy 504 plan. She's she's not making me feel like this is going to go real well. And so I take the time, educate myself, get everything put together, and we'll go in there. And And my job is now to advocate for this kid. I have to go in here, and I have to be willing to stand up and say the things that need to be said and argue with the principal, argue with an administrator, argue with a, with a, a therapist, you know, who seems to think that she knows everything. And I'm like, yeah, you know, everything they taught you in school. I get it, but you don't live with Frankie. I do. You know, a 504 plan can create some accommodations that would really help this kid. When his ADHD kicks in and his little brain starts to spin, like it moves supersonic. And if you can learn from me, the, the two or three things I can tell you will help him so much. You'll bring him into a place where he can emotionally re-regulate and join the classroom and be part of the discussion. And, and, and you'll have a, a great classroom again. Or you can do your typical teacher stuff. You can raise your voice and his little amygdala is going to go crazy. He's going to think he's in danger for the next 20 to 40 minutes. He's not going to be willing to talk to you. He's not going to engage. He's not going to read the thing you want him to read. He's struggling with reading because when he sits in class half the day, he's high in his anxiety. He's not learning. He's not comfortable learning. He's terrified that something's going to kill him. I mean, not consciously, but that's what happens when the amygdala goes crazy. And I've, I've learned this by watching him. And my job as a parent is to walk in and be willing to create as many healthy environments as I can in his life 
where he feels safe and he can begin to overcome some of these things. Yes, he'll probably have the symptoms of ADHD his whole life, but we can make it something that's much more manageable. And that's what my real job is to look at these kids and really truly understand who they are as human beings, as broken human beings. Not broken because they're in the foster system, broken because there are bad humans in the world who do things to people that they shouldn't. And I can create a healthiest possible environment so they can grow and they can thrive and they can learn to feel love and they can learn to become part of their environment. And with any luck, we will tip the numbers in the, in the, the system because half of the foster kids end up in jail when they get out of school. Half. I'm not willing to send half of my kids to the, to the prison system. I have other things I need to do with these kids so that that is not a problem that our family deals with. So, yeah, it's I, I have a lot of experience in that side of it. Um, the 504 plans are brand new. This is a brand new battle. So, yeah. You- yeah. Jay, Jay, you were looking into a 504 plan for, for Cohen, right? Weren't you uh, talking about that recently and maybe go on that route with the school? Yeah. As mentioned previously, uh, we have a school that's very much uh, focused on every individual child. And uh, when we talk about the 504 plan, it's almost like the school's like, that sounds great. Let's, let's have that discussion. Let's, let's work our way toward that if that's best for your son. So yeah, we, we've been talking about that uh, and uh, we'll see where that goes. Right now we're in this um, situation where uh, the school counselor has said, hey, I want to kind of have a conversation with your son. And uh, we're going to, you know, have that conversation over the course of a couple months. And then we're, you know, we're going to kind of compile that data and, and share it with you. And then we'll proceed from there. What, what everybody thinks is best and what you think is best for your son. So I, I really appreciate that approach because I don't think it's very much a defensive response that it sounds like, Jason, you've experienced a little bit of. Um, but I wanted to ask a question kind of related to that because I'm a little curious. You know, you said you want to create an environment of safety and security for these kids and then we also have the everyday day to day to day life. What do you do when they say, well, the, the place that you're continuing to send me to that you want to make safe for me is the place I never feel safe in. How do you how do you bridge that or have you had an opportunity to have a conversation maybe kind of like that? You know, honestly, I've had to. It's not a conversation I've had with them specifically because I don't think they're conscious of what's going on psychologically in school for them. You know, it comes out as. They're not, this isn't fair, you know, this teacher's mean, that, that's what it comes out as. Um, but what it's meant for us is, like, we, we've got one one kid who, um, they found his dad dead with a heroin needle in his neck, and mom spent a significant amount of time in the prison system for some drug stuff. Um, and that's just the surface level stuff that ended up sending, you know, sending him into foster care. I, I take the time at the beginning of the school year to go talk with the teachers. Now, I've learned that I have to be careful how much of their story I share. Because last year, he had a teacher who on Red Ribbon Day, if you don't know what Red Ribbon Day is, because I didn't, apparently it's what they do for like kind of the dare thing for kids in younger grades. It, the uh, the dare thing for, for the younger grades is this what they call Red Ribbon Day. And, and this teacher tried to pull him aside and talk to him about how his daddy was dead from drugs and his mom was in jail because of drugs. And I'm just going to say, I shared that story with her so she would understand who he was. He was at the beginning of the year dealing with a lot of heavy dissociation. But we've, we've got, you know, some therapists on board and really worked through a lot of that. We're, we're still working through it, but we've, we've got made some good strides. And she tried to pull him aside and talk with him about this when there were other kids around. And he came home pissed. Like you want to talk about an, a mad eight year old. And, and so I had to go back to the school and I, I, I actually went to the administrator. I said, look, I'm talking to you because I'm angry. And if I talk to the teacher right now, she's not going to hear what I have to say. She's going to hear the angry me being, being obnoxious. So I'm talking to you so we can do this intellectually. This is entirely inappropriate. This teacher has a teaching degree and that's what she's here to do. I have PhD counselors working with this kid. She is not one of them. She's not a therapist. She's not a counselor. And I have no clue what she thinks she's doing here, but she's destroying her relationship with this kid and making his feeling in school where he doesn't feel safe. He feels like, like this is something everybody's going to hear and everybody's going to know all about his backstory. And it's something he's uncomfortable with. So you need to straighten this out before I end up down at the school board. 
because this this should never have happened and it won't happen again and you know but i've gone to different teachers to have those conversations my little guy with the adhd stuff i got a phone call from the special reading teacher he's a little behind in reading so he has some extra help in reading and she calls me and like oh he wasn't this or that i'm like yeah that's because um you know you, there's a there's a girl in the class emma she's like well i can't talk about i'm I know you can't talk about different kids by name, but I can. So Emma is a butthead in class and causes you lots of problems. And then you raise her, your voice at her. Do you know when you raise your voice, it spikes his little amygdala for the next 20 to 40 minutes. He's trying to decide if he's even safe in this room. And you're trying to get him to read this passage for the fifth or sixth time. So he can have some practice reading. It's great educationally speaking, but he literally cannot do that in that moment. You have turned his fight or flight mechanism on and he's trying to decide whether it's time to run or time to fight because he feels threatened. You have created an environment that that makes him unable to learn. And this teacher is, she's about to retire this year. Actually, she's going to retire. And I would have thought she would have figured this out before, but she says to me, well, I never thought my behavior might cause some of these problems. I'm like, how many years have you been teaching and you had no clue, huh? that yelling at students might be affecting other students and so that's what it looks like for me is to go to teachers and take the time to be as as kind as i can and 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 calm and and understanding where i can until you hurt my kids and then then we got to have real serious conversations but to say hey here's some stuff and here are some great ways that i know from experience that will help him re-regulate his emotions when you see him beginning to spiral upward like, here's a few things you can try to stop the upward spiral and level him out and give him an opportunity to re-regulate. But that that's what I can give them in this. It sounds like it takes a lot of effort, brother. I'm going to be honest with you, for, for eight kids to advocate in that way. You know, JJ has a lot of difficulties advocating for his one kid in school. And we've got three, and I feel, ah, I can't juggle all these balls. And you've got eight over there, and you've got to step in and – and advocate and create that help create that space for each one of them like you say you know that's it's got to take a lot of a lot of time and energy just on sick days alone you know i the last year of my life has been one sick day after another with three kids i can't imagine eight kids round robbing every virus that comes through the household i mean <laughs> you have to have Dude, i have an am- i have an amazing immune system at this point I could eat a bowl of Ebola for breakfast and it would kill that stuff. Like, <laughs> they've given me every virus known to man. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm sure. But yeah, you know, I mean, that takes a lot of effort, you know, to advocate for our kids. So I'm, does your does your um, wife work or is she a stay-at-home mom to help with all that? I Because I, I'm just thinking from my perspective of being the stay-at-home dad, you know, with three kids, I often think to myself, I don't know how families do this without a parent being at home all the time to take care of the needs of just the house and the kids and to pack lunches and clean and do the laundry. And, you know, it takes someone, you know? So, I mean, I'm just, does your wife work or is she, she dedicated to being a a full-time mom? She has, she, she did work out of the home for, I don't know, about two years. Um, and it, we had too much stuff going on and life was getting difficult and COVID hit and all the craziness. And she came back home and she, she has been a stay at home mom for probably 13 of the last 15 years. Yeah. Actually, it's been more than that now. I don't know that you have to ask her the math, but for she, she's only worked about two of the, two of the last 20 or so years outside of the home. And she does do most all that. And right now with the two baby girls, we have, you know, we have two, two little ones that, can't go to school and need daily you know attention all day long and the uh, the youngest the baby was um was born with the inability to actually eat and so um she she's slowly starting to eat a bottle um but she needs she has a g-tube installed and so we do the g-tube feedings and all that and so she really needs constant care so she stays home with that but yeah it's it's a lot of work um honestly you just you give up the things that don't really matter like sleep and you just chase all these other things and do the things that, that you're here to do. Yeah, I'm a firm believer that God puts you in the place you're at, in the moment you're at, with the people who are around you for a reason. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's something that that has really guided me, especially over the last several years. You know, I I know the reason God put me on this earth. I have a spiritual purpose statement. I am here for a reason. 
And part of that is to be a father to the fatherless. That's what, I mean, I make decent money with, with what I do professionally. I drive here locally. I'm home every night. I make pretty good money. I don't really care about the money. That's not what's going to, because I'm going to tell you, I already know how old I am and I know how many medical things I'm facing. I ain't going to see 80 years old unless God has a really crazy sense of humor. All right. I'm going to be gone at some point. I really don't care what's in the bank account when I'm gone. There's a real reason I'm here. There are lives that I am here to change. That's what I care about. Yeah. So we put all the rest of that stuff kind of on the back burner. It doesn't matter that much. Because quite frankly, I drive around an old beat up two, 2002 pickup truck, I think it is, with some rust and like the tail light doesn't work half the time and, and the, you know all these little different things that aren't quite I don't care. I will never own a Bugatti. All right, I've given that dream up. I, I just, I know what I want in life, and it's not all that material crap. Yeah. Yes, it's nice to have something that nice every now and then, but I'm not going to have all that stuff. I'm going to spend all of my life's energy trying to accomplish the purpose. That Jason, I have a question for you in kind of relation to that. Um, earlier you had mentioned, you know, you had kind of sat back when your wife was mentioning the idea of fostering many kids and, and you thought, well, we couldn't even afford, you know, getting a kiddo from China, um, given the cost. Um, and now you're, you know, you've been in this for a while and you've, you, you said you've you found your calling and you're grateful and regardless of the money, this is where you're meant to be. Um, what does that look like? If somebody's listening, uh, what, what could they get? from this, like some advice or some tips um, into going into fostering and being able to, you know, find a way to make the means possible to continue to do what you love to do here. Realistically, um, the thing that turned us off at first was adopting a child from China because international adoption is expensive. And like I said, at the time I was making like 20 grand a year raising three kids. And I went, yeah, I don't have an extra 30 grand to do that. Um, and we ended up feeling led towards foster care eventually. And that's the route we went. And quite frankly, um, it's not so much a matter of what you can get out of it. Yes, depending on the state you're in, there, there's a stipend that you get for, for helping to take care of these kids. Um, ironically, right now, one of the local St. Louis media organizations has run a big story on how Missouri, where I live, is rated like the bottom in the nation on the foster system, right? I think our reimbursement rate is like second lowest or the lowest in the nation. I, last I looked at the numbers, I think I think they give you $236 a month to raise a kid. Right. I don't know about y'all, but that's not a lot of money. Don't we spend two hundred dollars a week on groceries? So, and there's three of us. You know, you get an extra fifty dollars a month for a diaper allowance if they're under two. <laughs> and let me tell you, diapers haven't gotten cheaper either. They show up at my door by the case, you know, <laughs> that, but, but that's what we do. And, and so realistically we lose a little bit of money every month, most months, but that's, that's neither here nor there. Really the reason why we do it is because, you know, of what we can give. The thing we do have, we were blessed with this big, beautiful house that you can't see, but it's just like a built in 190 something. Uh, it's, and it's not like a fancy house. Right? It's not rich. It, we, we spent less than $130,000 buying a 2,400 square foot house. And depending on the part of the world you live in, that could be crazy numbers, right? But we ha we have a big house. We have lots of room. We have my, my wife's a stay-at-home mom. We have the ability to, to speak into lives of kids who have something hard going on. My wife grew up through that. She has lived experience. She knows what that's like, you know? And so that that's how we're there. And Honestly, it's all about what, what you can give to these kids because most of the time, if you're making money off, off of being a foster parent, you're probably doing something horrible or you will live in one of the rare states that pay some kind of crazy huge amount of money. I don't know who that is, but it's not this state. Yeah, you know, what you're saying here uh, inspires me and, and warms my heart a little bit, you know, because going back to that, uh, those 
preconceived conversations that we were talking about earlier in the beginning of this podcast with people saying, why would you want to do this? You know, why would you want to go in to have these kids, you know, be around these kids that aren't yours and raise them and be responsible for them. And I've always kind of had the answer just in my mind there. It's been right there. It's, it's, it's easy, right? I mean, is it easy to raise these kids? Hell no, it's hard, right? But it is easy to love them. You know, it was very, very easy to come into this relationship when I met these kids and fall in love with them, you know, and, and all the hard stuff that I had to, to walk along the last three years here as, as I've been doing it, as it's been, easy because it's it's been such an inspiration and motivated by such a simple thing and that's just this love for these kids so all the hard stuff you have to walk through and and the navigating and the advocating at schools or or the navigating of boundaries with with bio dad or or outside perspectives or family members even you know it, it, it it's easy it's just easy for me because it, when you have so much love and you're experiencing so much love in a connection with this little person, you know, all the rest just felt easy. And I, and I didn't need to think about why, because the why was just right there every day in all these little interactions. So to hear you talk about that and, and how it's so motivating to you and, and why you do this, it, it sounds like the same thing. It's just that simple fact of love, you know, you, you're, you've got a lot of love in you um, and you want to share that. And that seems to radiate with your family and in the stories that you're sharing with us. So, you know, kudos to you, man. I, I love hearing that. I, I appreciate it, man. Yeah. It's a, yeah I, I did. A, I went through a process a while back with a guy and, and we sat down and worked out our spiritual purpose statement. Right. And I've known this guy for a while. And he says, you know, he, when I, when I got to the end and, and read it to him, he's like, I know it'd be something like that for you. You know, for me, it is this. As an imager of God, I am a father to the fatherless, a protector of his most vulnerable children. I help chaos find order. Um, yes, I help chaos find order as an, as an example of a God who calls us from the world through grace into a love that we don't deserve. And, and with, a, with, with a life purpose like that, like I have every opportunity to screw that up every day. Lots and lots of times I can, I can screw that up. But it also gives me something big to reach for. And most of the guys that I know, the guys that I work around, they, 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 their life's purpose is this. Get up and go to work on Monday so they can make some work. Spend yeah. all week long complaining about, about how their wife is this and she's that and she does these horrible things and their kids don't love them. Their kids are ungrateful and they're little a-holes and this, that. and other. So they go home on Friday afternoon, stop and grab a case or two of beer so they can drink beer on the weekends and watch whatever sporting event it is that is going on. You know, I, right now, as as we're talking, I think the Super Bowl is actually happening right now. I don't know for sure. I think it's today. I'm not a sports guy at all. But that, but but then they get up on Monday with a hangover and they're crabby because they their head hurts and they got to get up early and go to work and they repeat that process 52 yeah. times a year. That is the purpose of their life, and I don't understand why anybody would live that meaningless of a life. I want to live a life that counts, a life that matters. A life that, yes, has pain and, yes, has lots of struggles, but it's a life worth living. It's a life that when I die, a hundred years from now, my life will still be evident in the world, in the, the genealogies of the kids who have come through my home. That's, that's what I want to do. I want the world to matter. I don't want to live this, this little silly life where I got to cheer for my my team, you know, for the Stanley Cup or the Super Bowl or whatever sporting event and, and and drink beer and then and then what? That's it? Like that's a purpose of your life? And, and if you like sports, don't get me wrong. I'm not mad at guys who like sports. I, it's not my thing. I don't get it. But that's fine. You can be a sports guy. But when that is like the central positive theme of your life, man, that sucks. So I'm going to tell you, when I get to go to a sporting event, and watch somebody play a basketball game or a football game, and I see my last name running around on the, the field there, you know, three foot off the ground. Now, that's a sporting event I like to see. Yeah, I like to watch them go out and do that. That's super enjoyable to see them go out there and give them everything they have. I train my kids. Like, your job is to go out there on the field or the court or whatever and put everything you have into what you're doing. At the end of the game, I'm not congratulating a kid because they won. I won't. I don't. I ask the same question every time. 
Did you leave it all out there? You know, you look like you were really hustling. You were working hard. I'm proud of that, dude. I'm super proud of that because I don't care how they did in the third grade Super Bowl Pee Wee Football League. I care the lessons they learned and who that makes them as men growing up because I'm going to die. I have a plan not to not to make it happen to myself, but I plan on dying someday. That's going to happen. These kids are going to need to be able to be men enough and women enough to stand up and walk through this crazy world that is only getting crazier and go do something amazing. And that's what I, my gift to the universe. I can give that to the world after me. And and my eulogy will will be sitting in the in the pews in the in the church as as they talk about me. That that's that that's my eulogy. But it'll be all the kids that that, that have grown to be men and women uh, of of great character, men and women of God who will change the world for the better. And that's why I live my life the way that I do. And I know that's not the way that most people live their life. And that's fine if that's okay with you. If that's how you want to live, I'm not mad at you for it, but I won't live that way. I refuse. I'm going to go change the world. That's what I'm going to do. You know, you, you brought up an interesting point that I want to reflect back here for our listeners. And, and that's the mindset piece that you're talking about. You know, um, it's really easy to tell ourselves a story and get caught up in a loop of negativity you know, that life is hard, that the kids are loud or obnoxious or that the wife isn't loving you the right way or enough or too loudly, you know, whatever it is. And, you know, I think what I'm noticing here and listening to you talk and what, what I'm seeing in the success of your family and then the love that you have for your kids is that piece, that, that mindset piece of this isn't hard. This is easy because I have love and I have a purpose here and I have figured out my why and I realize that this is finite and I need to get it all in while I can, you know, and I think that that's very admirable. We have to digest life in that way, you know, instead of wanting to watch the game because, you know, but the kids are annoying or you're trying to send them out, you know, it's. It's about how can we include, how can we interact, how can we be present in a way that's motivating, that we want to. And I think, again, that's why it's so easy for me because I've figured out that piece of this is this is who I am. This is who I want to be. I want to be a dad. Whether you call me dad or bonus dad or stepdad, I want to be a dad to these kids and I want to help guide them and mold them and love them in a way that is supportive and safe and nurturing, you know? So though I get the feedback, you know, I have my why man, just like you. And it really gives me a lot of power in dealing with the, the dig, the negative moments, the hard moments, the moments where I've got to step up and advocate or put energy forth where I'm just not feeling it today. You know, like I said, those are hard. I'm not diminishing anybody out there that that's having a hard day with it. You know, I've been there myself, man. We all have as parents, you know, but the reason why I feel it's, it's easy for me to get back up is because I tell myself it's easy. Yeah, because it is hard sometimes, but it's worth it. And I, I've heard it attributed both uh, Victor Frankel, um, the mm -hmm. psychologist who was taken into, I believe it was Auschwitz. Um, meaning of man, uh, right? Or meaning of, what is it? The man's search meaning, for meaning. Man Search for Meaning, yes. Beautiful yep. book. Yep. It was either that book or it was Nietzsche. I've heard it attributed to both. It might have been something like this from both of them, who said, more or less, man can suffer any what if he has the right why. I, I can walk through any pain. You know, and if, if, if you just look a whole different world here, right? I, I'm, I was in the military for a couple of years. I was never the, the super cool guy who strapped on all the cool gear and did cool stuff. I wasn't that guy at all. But I met some of those guys. I knew Rangers. I met SEALs. I met Airborne and SF guys. I met Delta. Um, and some of the stories you hear about what those guys go through. Like, there's one guy, uh, sorry, was it Staff Sergeant? Bienvenidos, I think is his name. And if you just go look him up, Google his name, Bien, you know, Sergeant Bienvenidos, uh, find him on, on YouTube and, and you'll see him, his story told. This man was shot more times than you can count and stabbed and he was still carrying his buddies to the chopper to get him out of the field. 
Like, like they thought he was, they put him in a body bag. They thought he was dead. And the last thing he did was spit, spit and blood into the, into the, the doctor's face so that they knew he wasn't dead. He, I think he's still alive actually to this day, but this dude, like he went through some stuff, right? How did he go through it? Because he was out there saving his buddies. He was out there with the guys who, who mattered to him. And he was out, he was willing to fight that fight. He was willing to be shot and stabbed. And I mean, multiple times so that he could go out and fight the fight that was worth fighting. You know, and in this whole weird blended family we have, and I hear so many people say, you know, under the breath, well, blood's thicker than water. And I'm like, you're an idiot. <laughs> you know, if you know that tool saying, it, it's, it's the blood of battle is thicker than the water of the womb. The, the men, the women, the children, the people who fight the battles of life together, that is so much more important than, than the water of the womb, where you came from biologically. Yes, bio family is important. And that's part of the reason why, why we're staring at so many kids, because we have some biological siblings. We've, you know, we, we've, uh, the littlest one we have right now, she's with us because my seven-year-old is our biological sibling. And that's why she's there. So yeah, there's some DNA stuff that, that matters. But at the end of the day, the blood of battle that you shed with these kids through their hard stuff is worth way more than the percentage of DNA that you guys share. That's what we need. I wanted to do a, I wanted to share um, a situation with you guys because I, I love I love everything I'm hearing here and you know the idea of of loving somebody regardless of you know what their DNA looks like. Um, you mentioned blended families uh, as as I am a you know a single parent and uh, raising a, a a young boy who I love dearly and is my number one person in life because I, you know, I do not have a marriage partner. Um, I have dated and I have failed <laughs> so far in my dating life post-divorce. Um, there was one person in particular that I learned a lot from, um, grew to love. Um, and she had a son who was about twice my son's age at the time we were dating. I, I honestly am a better person because of her today, but ultimately our relationship didn't work. And the reason from my perspective that it didn't work is because I struggled to be fully committed to her and to her son. And the main reason that I attribute that to is because, and this is not a blame thing, her son would regularly tell me that he didn't like my son and didn't want my son around. And of course, I'm, a, you know, it's a package deal, of course, because my son is right now my number one person. So when it comes to loving this woman who has just all these amazing qualities and has made me a better man, I'm also loving her son in ways that, you know, a lot of people would say you're crazy. But because that relationship between the two boys was taking place and, and her son did not like my son for whatever reasons, um, I was always feeling this distance. And she picked up on that. She didn't define it the way I might define it today to you, you guys. But it was something that definitely kept me at a little bit of a distance with her. And that's really painful to admit. But as a result, we talk about love and we talk about saying, this is my kid. This is my son. I wanted that, but I also was so conflicted because I cared so deeply for my biological son, who I have total commitment to seeing the pain that somebody doesn't want him nearby. So it just, you know, it was just kind of a perspective that I was kind of bringing to this idea of love. Yes, I loved them and wanted them, you know, wanted there to be a family there, but it was also very difficult. Oh, I, I hear you there, man. And I, I give... I can give you all kinds of marriage advice. You know, my wife and I have been together for, I don't know, close to 20 something years. Um, I think I met her right when I got out of the army. So it would have been, you know, 2000. We watched the twin towers fall together after we had been together for, for several months already, at least. Uh, so it's, it's been 20 something years we've been together and, and we have done a lot of marriage stuff together and we've been through the hard stuff. We've had our hardest days, you know, we buried our oldest daughter together. 
and we, we have walked deep waters and i will tell you in in that respect my wife comes first and that's that's how i can model model for my kids what a healthy relationship looks like that first it's me and my wife that's our relationship and i'm going to train you how to be a young man who who who's knows how to treat a woman well or a young girl who knows how to treat her husband well and a young man who knows what to look for in a woman and a young girl who knows what to look for in a man that being said in those 20 something years we've had together we we've always been us and i've never dealt with the struggles of divorce and relationship after that so i have no idea what that actually looks like you know from a personal perspective but i know that when it comes to you know actual marriage once once we have made that commitment that's how we've looked at it you know so many people want to oh i want to give my kids the best and, and my kids come first no my wife comes first and my kids come second and I probably come in somewhere around fifth or sixth in my life. <laughs> yeah, I, I know it probably shouldn't be that way. I should have more self-care and all that. But but that that's what we've had to do because we've walked the dark roads. You know, we've you know, we we've we've held our char our child's casket. We have seen what, what the, the terrible, horrible things are. We have had kids who stayed with us who we thought were gonna stay with us long term and had to let them go. We've had so many things that were hard to do, but we've had to learn to do it together. And we, we, you know, like all relationships, it ebbs and flows. Sometimes we're really closely connected and it's amazing and beautiful. And sometimes she's just the gal that I see come, you know, come in and out of the house sometimes, or she sees me coming into the house occasionally. And sometimes that, because like you mentioned, Colton, like, like we are stupid busy. You know, we have five kids in the house. We have one two three four five i think five therapy appointments a week you know three or four basketball practices usually a couple games um i work a, a 50 to 60 hour work week um our daughter's in every club you can be in because she's going to get every scholarship known to man she's going to end up over at yale medical school or something and i'm gonna be crying when i start getting bills but you know we, we're busy we're stupid busy. And so sometimes it's hard. But again, it falls into the into that same line of it's hard and it's worth it. So we do everything that we can to, to be intentional about that. And quite frankly, there's a reason I don't go out with the friends and have a drink or, or have, you know, go go eat dinner with, with a friend of mine hardly ever. I don't have that time in my life. You know, I have things to do. We run a podcast for crying out loud. And if anybody who's done that, you know how much time that takes. Like, it's ridiculous. But, you know, we have all these things in our life because these are the things that truly matter to us in a way that, that's hard to quantify for somebody who doesn't live my life. And so we put all of our life's energy into that. And and when the day finally comes that they, they lay me six feet under the ground, I'm going to know that I have lived a life that's worth living. I want to be exhausted. And it's okay. Because it will have been a life's worth of energy spent in service of something worth doing. You know, you, you brought up an interesting point that's been making me think over here. Because um, when you're talking about the my, my wife comes first kind of dynamic in your family. And I really agree with that. But in a it's making me stop for a second and ponder JJ's situation over here being a single dad, you know, and like when, how do you prioritize that when a new woman or a potential partner comes into your life and you're, you want like that should be modeled and should be prioritized, but you have to put your kid first, right. In the beginning stages, in the early stages of this. And, and at what point is, is there a switch of priority or, Okay, so I want to tell you a quick story before, we, as we wrap up here, and and I, I would love to um, leave our audience with uh, some more info about your your podcast there, Jason, that you just mentioned. But you know, I'm, I'm thinking of the the dynamic of here between my wife and I, and you know, again, going into dating a woman with kids, you know, we had talks about look, my kids are priority, you know, they come first, and I had to you know be from that perspective of cool, I get it totally. You know, and again, if you're going to date someone with kids, I think you have to, 
you know, which is difficult because, you know, dating in your teens and 20s is all about me, me, me. How do you benefit? How can I love you so that you love me in a way that benefits me? And, you know, it's in, but in this situation, it was like, whoa, this woman has important things in her life that I need to respect, that I need to recognize, and that I need to navigate, you know? And, there was, you know, after a year of dating uh, during COVID, you know, so there was a lot of boundaries to navigate there of, you know, masks and vaccinations and variants and lockdowns. And, you know, a lot of our courtship was over, you know, video calls and, and phone calls getting to know each other. And there was a time where I was working and my work got compromised because of COVID outbreaks. And this was early stages, man, before we even had variants or vaccinations yet. You know, it they were taking it serious. It was lock yourself indoors and wear a mask and don't touch anything, you know, and disinfect all your groceries. Remember that when you had to disinfect your groceries? <laughs> you know, that. so it happened and, you know, I had to lock down, but my roommate, I uh, had a dad who's going through chemo, immunocompromised, you know, I, and I was trying to navigate with my work of a place to stay while I was quarantining because I couldn't go home and I couldn't go to my girlfriend's house. She had a newborn baby and, you know, where am I going to go? I got sick on work's die or work's time. So kind of felt they were responsible and it just, you know, kind of spiraled, but got to a point where I, I ended up having to, my work couldn't accommodate me. I couldn't get into a hotel and my wife kind of had to take take me on. And, uh, you know, she locked me up in her third, her third story. And, uh, we sent the kids to a hotel for a week and she wore gloves and masks and, you know, covered herself up and brought me food, you know, as I quarantine, you know, and that that's not to say that that was like a switch of priority in our dynamic, but it was a moment that I realized like, wow, like this woman is making room for me in her life and importance and priority you know, and we started that dynamic more frequently of let me pour into you to show these kids this healthy dynamic and how to set them up for relationships and future. Not to say that my wife prioritizes me now, but it was definitely um, a moment in our relationship where some of that was given to me, you know, and that importance or prioritization. And, you know, it's just, again, just thinking about that in re relation to what we're saying and in JJ's unique situation, because yeah, what, what, what time does, does JJ make that switch or give some of that prioritization back to that partner or, you know, it's just interesting. Yeah. I imagine that's gotta be difficult. My, my guess is it's, it's probably like a slider, right? I've got these sliders on this little board over here where I can pull it down and I'll get softer and softer and softer. And eventually I'll just disappear, right? And that that's kind of, we, we all have to start at that place where, look, my kid's priority. I mean, if something happened to my wife, God forbid, how would I ever find a woman crazy enough to take on a man that looked like this with that many kids, right? With eight kids. I'd be in yeah. trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, the thing is, is that they would have to be full-blown priority first. Because you meet people out here in the world. And I'm going to tell you, you meet all kinds of people. In this world, do you meet American heroes on a daily basis? There are Army Rangers, SF, and and Delta guys and Navy SEALs who live in your neighborhood who you don't have a clue who they are, who will go to war to defend you. There are also pedophiles in your circle that you don't know are pedophiles. And I've met both of those people. I remember once when I was a kid, my dad was a police officer, and all of a sudden he shoved me. There was one of the, the grocery stores where they had the counter and you bagged your own groceries. He shoves me up against the counter and reaches under the back of his shirt. Mind you, he's in plain clothes this day, but I know what's under the back of his shirt because I, I grew up with a man. There's a snub nose 38 back there. And I'm thinking, oh, dear God, what's about to happen, right? And this guy leaves the store and he goes out and he, he pulls me around. He says, you see that guy getting that gold car right there? I said, yeah. He says, does he look like a rapist and murderer to you? Uh, you know, I was probably nine or 10 years old. I'm like, I, I don't know, you know, but he's like, I put him away 15 years ago for rape and murder. I don't know what he's doing on the street. I recognized him, but he didn't recognize me, thankfully. But, you know, those people live amongst us. They're out here. So we have to be super vigilant about the people who we bring into our kids orbit. And so I would imagine like that whole dating thing 
for a guy like me who is super overprotective because of what I've seen, that would be that would be miserable for me to walk through because I am very, very overly protective about that kind of stuff. But as you get to know somebody and you learn who they are and you learn that this is a genuinely good person and you build that trust, I imagine there's that slider where you, you can start to let go of some of those things and and you just so you still keep your eyes open, but it's less suspicious. And eventually, once you've been with somebody for 10 years and you're like yeah this this is a full thing like we're, we're together for sure like for the we we went and gotten married and said till death do us part yeah this, at this point it's it's time to, to switch that priority a little bit but not easy not easy luckily my wife was naive enough to trust me and i got this far so <laughs> yeah it all worked out but you're right it could have gone so many bad directions (laughs) yeah i don't know what she was thinking man (laughs) well jason this has been such a pleasure man i i'm so glad that we had you on today I, i got a lot from the conversation and i hope our listeners did too as we wrap up um i would love to just hear a little bit more about about your your podcast here how long you've been doing it and um what kind of guests you have on and just you know kind of uh what your direction is with that you know we started this um well going back to to when we lost our daughter um we weren't we weren't in a healthy emotional place we'll just put it that way that's the easy way to put it we were not in a healthy emotional place for a hot minute as anyone would expect and and so we we closed our foster license and we said it's time for us to take some some time to just kind of regroup here and um after some months had passed and i don't remember how long it was a while i looked at my wife and i said i feel like we should be doing something i don't think we're ready to take in kids again you know we're taking kids from super hard places and we were still trying to just learn how to get up and and breathe in the morning like we're still in that place but i feel like we should be doing something i said i'm gonna write i'm gonna try and write a blog site turns out that takes a lot of freaking work (laughs) especially when you're not a fast writer and i said something about it to my wife and she says well what about one of those podcast things you listen to all the time you you talk a lot you could do that i'm like yeah maybe Uh, so i did a little bit of you know real serious youtube research and said yeah it's actually not that hard to to begin to throw something together so Three years ago this past November, um, so that would have been 19, November of 19, I think, um, we uh, well, I just we put out our first episode and we started just recording stories around foster care and adoption. And to date, we've had everything from psychologists and social workers and foster parents and former foster parents and, and, and adoptive parents and adoptees. And, and we've had we've even had some some uh, foster youth. Um, down to we had one particular story which i want to tell you like it was an honor to be allowed into that room when we recorded it but at the same time it almost broke me because this we had interviewed this woman and her husband they were foster parents and they had adopted this young girl was actually i think her niece originally her biological niece and and she said you need to talk to my daughter so we, we we invited her on we did the thing and and she's 14 years old and she tells her story of sexual abuse at the age of six and how that impacted her life and, and growing through that. And so we just, we leave it all kinds of room open for whether or not you've been in there or you're somebody who works with kids who, you know, who are in hard places or therapists. I've gotten a lot of great information from therapists just to see this on a daily basis. That's our job. And so that's what, what we tend to lean towards is anybody who's had an experience whether it was their personal experience growing up in foster care or having some stories or, or adoption or, um, you know, the adults who are either caregivers or support staff in the lives of these kids. And, you know, try and take the stigma off of foster care and adoption a bit so that we can, we can turn this around. Because in all honesty, here's what I do know. There are close to 500,000 children in the foster system in the United States right now. And we need more people who are not afraid to step in and give these kids a home. Because if everything goes as I expect, by this time next year, we may well be working on number 10. I'm not allowed to talk about that one yet. But I, okay, if I can have 10 kids, right? That's not much of a dent in the 500,000. But if I can convince 10 other people to do that too, 
and, and, and take in the 30 plus kids that we've had come through. Well, now that's 300 kids at least. And so that, that's really our goal is, is to show people that this is a need. And yes, you can do it too. And begin to create more spaces in this world where kids can be cared for. Because quite frankly, these are the folks who are going to make the decisions about our health care, about the, the nursing homes that we get put into, about our taxes. These are the people. We're raising that generation of people. And we need to do a better job than what we've done in generations past. Yeah, that's the thing that I love uh, about listening to the the episodes that I've listened uh, with Foster Care Nation is it's hard as some of those stories may be to hear, um, you know, that why is always present in that background. And a lot of the guests that you have on and between you and your wife, you always circle around to that why, why you do it and why it's easy. And it's just very uplifting and and uh, gives a lot of hope uh, to the the um foster care, you know, epidemic <laughs> and all the kids that do need good homes. So thank you for doing what you do, uh, really and truly. And uh, not to worry, listeners, uh, we, we will put a link to Jason's uh, podcast in our show notes, as well as some of the resources we've talked to or talked about today, like uh, Victor Frankel's Man's Search for Meaning. And um, so, yeah, thank you, Jason, for coming on. Uh, thank you, JJ. Um, for sitting quietly in the background. I know we kind of just talked over yet, but <laughs> you had hey, some good questions. You know, you know what I always say? <laughs> you know what I always say? If you're enjoying a meal, there's no reason to stop and talk about it. Just keep eating. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> JJ, the problem with that mentality is you end up looking like me if you have too many of those meals. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you again, Jason and JJ and all of our listeners uh, for you guys' support. Please make sure to like, subscribe, tune in, and and catch us on the next episode. So thank you. Uh, this is the ADH Dads. I'm CJ. I'm JJ. And thank you, Jason. We'll see you guys next time. Yeah.